Whether you're learning to walk for the very first time, or maybe learning how to ride a bicycle without the training wheels, or maybe playing instruments such as a guitar or piano, or maybe you're learning to jump over a hurdle with the finesse of a galloping gazelle, muscle memory is truly something special. I mean, how does the brain work with skeletal muscles to not only improve at the movement over time, but for you to think less and less about it the more you do it? It is seriously impressive. Well, in today's video, with the help of the cadavers here in the lab, we're going to be looking at the various regions of the nervous system associated with the execution and, more importantly, the refinement of skeletal muscle activity. It's going to be a memorable one. Let's do this. First and foremost, muscles do not store memories, or at least not in the same sense that your cerebral cortex or hippocampus does. And we know this just based off of amputees, right? If an amputee has a robotic prosthetic, they're still able to flex their elbow, right? It's not as though the loss of biceps brachii meant that they forgot how to flex their elbow. But that doesn't mean that muscles don't store important information, especially as it pertains to muscle memory. But we will discuss that information in a later video. In today's video, I want to focus primarily on the neurological aspect of muscle memory. But so if, if muscles don't really have memory, what are we really talking about here? We're talking about motor learning and motor development. Now, motor development is the process of brain maturation and hitting specific developmental milestones as you age, right? So you can see from a newborn as they go into childhood, adolescence, and so on and so forth. Now, it's important to understand that within motor development, there is a large genetic component to it as well as some environmental aspects. So they've actually done studies looking at identical twins and seeing that they essentially hit the same developmental milestones at the same time. Even if you give more environmental stimulus to one of the identical twins and not the other. So for instance, let's say I have a toy, we're playing with that newborn, trying to get them to grasp it and play with it in ways that we're not doing with the other one. Well, they still hit the same milestones at the same time. But what's interesting is you do start to see later on in life that there is some differences. They start to separate in some of their motor abilities and some of that could be attributable to what you're doing environmentally with them at a young age. So I'm not saying don't play with children or stimulate children. For sure do that. It's just interesting to see that within motor development, a lot of it is just predetermined, right? The person, that child, is going to hit those milestones when they're supposed to. So what we're going to be talking about primarily today is what's known as motor learning. And motor learning is extremely interesting, but in order to best understand it, we need to understand what's happening neurologically when a muscle is contracted. But real quick, I want to thank the sponsor of today's video, Yoga Body Teachers College. They specialize in science-based online certification programs for yoga teachers, yoga breathing coaches, yoga trapeze teachers, and stretching coaches. If you're interested in starting a new career or a side job, helping people improve their health, overcome injuries, manage stress, and live their best lives longer, Yoga Body's courses might be right for you. Yoga Body takes a science-based, business-positive approach to yoga. They turn passionate students into successful teaching professionals. Since 2007, Yoga Body has certified over 23,000 teachers in 41 countries. They are backed by Yoga Alliance, American Council on Exercise, and even American Council on Education, making them one of the only schools in the world eligible for college credits. Yoga Body has put together a free report for you called How to Choose a Yoga Teacher Training Program. You can access it immediately at yogabody.com forward slash IHA. You are looking at a right hemisphere of the cerebrum, which is this highly folded area, the cerebellum, which is going to be down here, and then we can also see part of the brainstem. Now, if I flip it around, you're going to be able to see these structures in greater detail. So again, that highly folded area is going to be the cerebrum. Down here, this really cool structure is known as the cerebellum, and we can also see the brainstem, but when you look at it from this medial view, you're also going to see some internal structures. This is what we call the diencephalon. But there are also going to be structures that we just cannot see because they're kind of like they're deep, right? So if my, where my fingers would be intersecting all along here, there are going to be accessory structures that we're going to be discussing later on. Now, it, let's go ahead and figure out exactly what's happening if I wanted to wiggle my fingers. So in order to do that, let's really quickly 
understand some other landmarks. So you'll notice there is a line that goes all the way up like this. This line here is what's known as the central sulcus. And what it does is it separates the frontal lobe, which is all of this here, from the parietal lobe, which is going to be here. You'll also notice there is a line going sideways right here. This is called the lateral sulcus, and this separates the frontal lobe from the temporal lobe. Now, if we're looking at the frontal lobe, there are going to be specific areas that we're going to be focusing on. So again, this is going to be a little difficult to tell, but roughly about right here, because in order to really understand where a lot of these areas begin and end, you'd have to be looking at a microscope. So generalizing at this macroscopic level is perfectly acceptable. But this right here is what we call the prefrontal cortex. But this is where, say like, um, and actually I did an entire video on the prefrontal cortex, so we'll go ahead and link above for you to check that out. But this is where things like morality, empathy, rational decision making, you can just think of it, this is where you are located. This is where your personality and just you as a person are essentially located, at least the conscious aspect of yourself. But for today's video, we're going to be focusing more so on these areas right here. So again, if we find that central sulcus and we trace it up, just in front of it, there is a narrow strip that we call the primary motor cortex. Then, if we can look up here, in about right around this area here, this is what's known as the supplementary motor cortex. And then down around right here, this is what's known as the premotor cortex. And then, again, behind that central sulcus, there's another strip just like here as I'm outlining my probe, called the primary somatosensory cortex. These four areas are all going to be involved in muscle contractions. Now, I should also really quickly differentiate, well, what I mean by cortex versus lobe. So for a second ago, I said this is the frontal lobe. Well, a lobe versus cortex, what we're really talking about is gray versus white matter. So if I turn this around again and you look closely, you're gonna see that there is gray strips on the outside of it, you're also going to see a bunch of white strips. Gray matter is where cellular processing is going to be occurring. So this is where neurons are communicating with one another. So if I wanted to wiggle my fingers, well, that is going to actually be happening in those motor areas of the cortex or the gray matter. So gray matter is the cortex. White matter is where the signal is then sent. So what will happen is that signal would travel through the white matter and eventually make its way down, and we'll trace this pathway again in just a moment, but down to the fingers. So if we're talking about the frontal lobe, the frontal lobe includes the white and gray matter in that frontal section. But if we're just talking about the gray matter, we're talking about the cortex, and that is just the surface of the brain, and it's just going to be that gray matter. Now, the cortex itself is actually layered, or has what are known as laminae. And there are six layers. And I know that doesn't really look like it, because again, if you go to this and see just how thin this gray area is, there are six distinct layers here. And what you'll find in these layers are different cell types and just different other kind of proteins and molecules. But what we're really gonna be focusing on is inside of the fifth layer, there is a large cell called a large pyramidal cell that we also can call an upper motor neuron. So what's going to happen is this is, the, this is the excitatory cell in terms of muscle contraction. So this is what is going to send that signal. Now initially, if you want to you know, contract the muscle, that's going to originate inside of the prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex says, hey, I want to wiggle my fingers. So then you're going to then send signals to that primary motor cortex, the primary somatosensory cortex, and these other ones saying, let's wiggle the fingers. And what will happen is they will then, that large pyramidal upper motor neuron will excite and that will st then start sending a signal. But there's another thing I do want to quickly clarify. You may be wondering, well, if this area is called the primary somatosensory cortex, wouldn't that be sensation? Why, why are we talking about this having motor neurons? Well, this is actually super interesting. Yes, this area of the brain is responsible for, for processing feeling, right? As I'm like poking my hand, that signal right, is being sent to the primary somatosensory cortex and that's where I'm understanding it. Wouldn't it make sense 
to also have upper motor neurons that then can respond to that stimulus in the same vicinity and then it can kind of modulate it. That's exactly what happens. So around 30% or so of the upper motor neurons are gonna actually be located in your primary somatosensory cortex. Kind of wild. All right, so what's gonna happen is, again, we, so we wanna do it, we're gonna send that signal and it's essentially, and I'm gonna kind of skip a few steps because it can get really super detailed, but we will address some of them later on. That signal is then going to travel through various regions of the brain and go down into the brainstem. And if I lift this up here, this area of the brainstem specifically is what is known as the medulla oblongata. And it's here that the signal is actually going to switch sides. So let's say I wanna wiggle my left fingers. Well, that impulse is going to originate inside of the right hemisphere in those motor areas. And it'll travel down, get to the medulla oblongata, and that's where it'll switch sides. Then what'll happen is the upper motor neuron will descend down the spinal cord in a specific white matter tract way called the corticospinal tract. From here, it will then synapse or meet up with a secondary motor neuron called a lower motor neuron, which that will then exit the spinal cord, go through a spinal nerve, and eventually make its way to the muscles that can then cause the contraction. So this is going to be that typical pathway. But this is the thing, is that's just saying, okay, we're sending the signal straight to the muscle. But there's gonna be a lot of steps that can help modulate and change that. So let's go ahead and look at that now. Now just a moment ago, you may remember me saying that this area is called the cerebellum, and that just means little brain. The cerebrum, which is this highly folded region, that actually translates directly to brain. Now the cerebellum is fascinating for multiple reasons. Again, it's just really awesome to look at. But this is actually receiving incoming sensory information based around position. So think about it like this. Every single one of your soft tissues, so your joints, your muscles, your tendons, your ligaments, all have sensory neurons inside of them that are relaying to the cerebellum positional information. So right now, biceps is a certain length, triceps is a certain length, and that information tells my cerebellum that my elbow is in its extended state. But if I move biceps, triceps is also along for the ride, that change is then processed within the cerebellum, and again, I now know my elbow is flexed. So if I close my eyes, it's not as though I feel as like I've, I've disappeared. Now there's other aspects of the brain. Now again, we can't see these. If you remember me just a moment ago saying that there were deeper down structures, we can see like part of it, like this hollow aspect of the brain here is called the lateral ventricle. And on the walls of the lateral ventricles, that's where we, if you could see in there, we would actually be seeing portions of what are called the basal ganglia or the basal nuclei. Now the basal ganglia, there are three of them. You have the caudate nucleus, the putamen, and then the globus pallidus. Now there are other structures that are commonly associated with the basal ganglia, like the, uh, the substantia nigra, for instance, but those aren't technically basal ganglia. Now these are also receiving incoming information from all over the body. Now these are gray matter, so they are, uh, this is where processing is occurring, and what's happening is they are essential for making plans around motor movement and motor behavior. So think about it like this. I have all this incoming information going to the cerebellum, going to the basal ganglia, the upper motor neurons, if we go back here, so those upper motor neurons that were in these motor areas, those large pyramidal neurons, are going to start sending, as they're going down into that lateral corticospinal tract, are actually gonna send offshoots to the cerebellum and into those basal ganglia in order to modulate. Because if they're saying, look, this is where your joints are at, this is where your muscles and soft tissues are at, how about we contract in this subtle way? Think about it like in terms of, what if you're LeBron James? Right, LeBron James, no matter how good he is, still has to warm up. When he gets onto the court, let's say he just woke up and I said, LeBron, like I woke up LeBron James and I said, get out there and start shooting the basketball, LeBron. I don't know why he'd listen to me in this scenario, but let's just go with it. LeBron would get out there and as he's shooting the basketball, he's gonna be amazing, no doubt, but he still needs to warm up. So as his muscles are contracting, information from that contraction is actually being relayed to the cerebellum and, and the basal ganglia. And they're saying, ah, oh, we need to tweak that. 
So then they send the signal back up to those motor areas and synapse with the upper motor neurons and modulate, tweaks how the signal is sent. So you start to get a more efficient signal that is then going to travel down to the spinal nerves. This is why warming up is so essential. This is motor learning, right? Now think about it like this in terms of, um, you know, LeBron James is already good. So let's say we, we trace it back in time, right? Back when LeBron is five or six years old. I don't know when he started playing basketball, but let's just say it's five or six years old. When he's doing that, and he's first starting to learn how to shoot the basketball, well, it's a new, it's a new behavior. It's a new uh, series of motor tasks. All of that is still gonna be happening, but the more he practices, the more the brain is saying, oh, this is an important task. We need to prioritize this pathway. How, essentially, when you are getting good at something, when we're talking about the neurological component of muscle memory, we're just saying, how efficient are you at speaking between these motor areas, these motor areas right here, and the cerebellum, and the basal ganglia. The more efficient you are at you speaking all of, or having all of these speak to each other, then the more proficient you're going to be at that task. And then the more you do that, what ends up happening is that tract way, because if you recall me saying that white matter, white matter is actually the signal being sent. Well, what makes that white? These are axons of neurons that are wrapped in lipids. We call this process myelination. The more you use a pathway, the thicker the myelination is going to become and the more efficient the signal is going to be transmitted. So as LeBron is practicing, What's happening is the body's like, oh, this is an important thing to do. It myelinates these pathways and makes the process more efficient. This is what we're talking about with muscle memory. But it's not just LeBron James with basketball. This is you with all sorts of tasks. You know, I, I've been playing guitar for 15 years. That makes me sound like I'm really good, but I'm not. But there are certain songs that I can have a full-on conversation with someone and play it, and that's because my body has learned to prioritize that pathway. I have played Tom Petty's Free Fallen, I, I'm not even, I'm not uh, lying here, probably around 10,000 or more times. I can play free falling really well. And that's because I have that muscle memory, the neurological component of it. It's just a very efficient and effective speaking uh, between those motor areas, the cerebellum, and inside, and the basal ganglia. But like I said, this is only one aspect to muscle memory. There's so much interesting uh, stuff to talk about when it comes to practicing. Should you practice in more of a block format? As in, you know, I practice at the same time every single day in the same way for the same length, or should you do more randomized practices? And this goes for playing instruments. Uh, any type of new behavior that you're trying to do, all of this falls underneath that umbrella of motor learning. But again, we will discuss that as well as the muscular components in a future video. Thanks for watching everybody. I really appreciate you hanging out with me. Be sure to look at that link in the description below for Yoga Body Teachers College. As always, be sure to like, comment, subscribe if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you in the next video.